let's get started. Uh, as uh, uh, Francois Xavier said, my name is Gani Shankar and I am an associate lecturer in the School of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering in the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, today I'm going to talk about analytical and numerical modeling of soft media with resonant inclusions. As we are going to see shortly, these kind of complex media are commonly employed as acoustic coating, as an acoustic coating on marine vessels. And the application of these coatings are twofold. Firstly, it is for stealth or uh, discretion. And secondly, it is to re reduce marine noise pollution. This is my team. Uh, the results which I'm going to present today uh, the, have been generated in collaboration with uh, uh, collaborators from UNSW Sydney in Salion and DST, Australian Defence Science and Technology. Awesome. So give me a thumbs up if you know what acoustic metamaterial is. Uh, I see a couple of thumbs up. Yeah. Great. So I think by now most of us know what acoustic metamaterials are. Acoustic metamaterials are rationally designed composites which allow for material properties or some properties in an effective sense to go beyond those of their bulk ingredients. In general, uh, acoustic metamaterials are designed with periodic resonant inclusions in a host medium, but periodicity is not necessary. Uh, it's just that it's easier to manufacture uh, a sample when you have periodicity. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have seen this figure. This figure is one of the, uh, th this metamaterial is actually one of the first, uh, first experimental work that was done by Professor Ping Shing's group in Hong Kong. So they were able to show that when they had lead, lead spheres coated with soft rubber and arranged periodically in epoxy uh, host medium, they were able to generate a band gap which was much lower which occurred at a few orders of wavelength lower than the wavelength of sound. So that band gap was associated with the local resonance of the uh, inclusions here. Acoustic metamaterials, as we know, they exhibit frequency dependent properties, frequency dependent material properties. Uh, and at certain frequencies, you can have you can have the, the material properties values to be zero or even negative. So what, what does negative density mean or negative modulus mean? Uh, it simply means that uh, for a natural material, for example, if you apply force in this direction, the acceleration is also going to be in that direction. But for acoustic metamaterials, uh, you may have acceleration in opposite direction compared to where you're applying force. So this is this is possible due to uh, resonance resonant phenomena within acoustic metamaterials. Similarly, you can have negative effective modulus, uh, and what that means is that, for example, for a natural material, if you compress it, the vol its volume is going to reduce. But for acoustic metamaterials, uh, certain designs of acoustic metamaterials, you can have negative effective modulus, and that means that when you compress, let's say a ball made of a material, it's going to increase in volume. So these are some fancy properties of acoustic metamaterials. Uh, and underwater, uh, I'm sure you guys are aware of many different applications of acoustic metamaterials, but an underwater application of acoustic metamaterials is as in what is called acoustic coating or an equate coating. Acoustic coatings are commonly employed in on marine vessels and they serve dual purpose. The first purpose is to control underwater noise pollution, and the second purpose is stealth, stealth from both active and passive sonar. So here I have a picture of a submarine hull, which is coated with acoustic tiles. Uh, in general, acoustic coatings can be classified into two categories. First is called decoupling coating. The job of a decoupling coating is to block the transmission of sound in the ambient marine environment, right? So uh, I, I'm sure you all know how passive sonar works. Passive sonar actually detects the sound radiation uh, 
from a marine vessel and then based on that it locates uh, its position right so decoupling coating one of the applications of decoupling or decoupling coating could be to could be stealth from passive sonar uh, on the other hand the purpose of an anechoic coating is to absorb external acoustic waves so uh, you have your sonar waves uh, your, your incident sonar waves the anechoic coating absorbs most of it so that you have very little reflected very little or no reflected pressure and that's how uh, you will be able to hide your submarine or hide your uh, object underwater so in general, acoustic coatings are made of soft rubber kind of material with periodic inclusions. So uh, the acoustic impedance of soft rubber is very close to the acoustic impedance of water, and that's why it makes it a really good candidate to design acoustic coatings. Soft rubber, uh, they have really high shear damping, but the, uh, the damping of longitudinal waves is not that great. So to fully utilize the shear damping in soft rubber, you embed, uh, you include some scatterers in your uh, material, and those scatterers scatter the sound in different directions and they convert your pressure waves or longitudinal waves to shear waves, which are efficiently absorbed in your coating. Uh, two most commonly used types of scatterers are cavities, just cavities in a soft rubber or heavy metallic inclusions, for example, steel inclusions. And this is just a schematic diagram showing uh, this is steel, which is basically an idealized version, version of submarine hull. And then you have your acoustic coating. This is made of soft rubber, and in that you have scatterers. And as I said before, scatterers can be either hard inclusions or heavy metallic inclusions or just cavities. And then you have water on the other side. Uh, my animation is not playing here for some reason. Yeah, now it's playing. So uh, when you have cavities in a soft medium, they exhibit what is called monopole resonance. Monopole resonance is basically a sort of pulsating motion. Uh, like, like if you take a balloon and if you fill it with air or take air out, you will see that pulsating motion. So when you have cavities in a soft medium, they exhibit monopole resonance. Uh, on the other hand, if you have hard inclusions in a soft medium, they exhibit dipole resonance. So here, uh, if you have, uh, for example, if you have a hard inclusion uh, and you have sound, incident sound pressure in this direction, you will see that at certain frequency, your inclusion will start oscillating in the direction of sound propagation, which is called dipole motion. Uh, Acoustic coatings, as I was saying, uh, are generally designed with uh, uh, voided or hard inclusions. Uh, the type of acoustic coatings I study are mainly these three types. Uh, coating comprising only voids, coating comprising only hard inclusions, and coatings comprising both hard and voided inclusions. So I'm going to talk about these three designs in my talk today. Uh, again, uh, you generally have two backing conditions uh, when you want to characterize an acoustic coating. Water backing, uh, for the water backing case, you have water on both incidence and transmission sides of your coating. Uh, whereas on the uh, for the steel backing case, you have water on the incident side. You have, you have your incident wave coming in this direction. And then on the transmission side, you have a steel plate followed by air. So this is sort of idealizing your marine vessel. So I'm going to talk about results for these two backing cases in my presentation today. So this slide describes the model, uh, mathematical model. This is, uh, I mean, I'm going to start with uh, two dimensional models first uh, because it's really important to understand what's happening in two dimension and then uh, you can always extend it to three dimension, right? So here I just have a sheet of rubber and in that I have holes, periodic holes and uh, so this is basically representing that the cavities or the cylinders are of infinite length and I'm only just modeling just a layer of it, right? So here I have incident wave, which is generally plain acoustic wave for my case. And then I have water on the incident side 
and water on the transmission side for the water backing case. Right. Uh, in cavities, I have vacuum. You can also have air. In my experience, it doesn't change the results by my by a lot, uh, especially when you don't have any hydrostatic pressure. When you have hydrostatic pressure, then it's a different story. Uh, but in general, it is safe to assume that you have vacuum in your cavities for for acoustic purposes. So uh, in my group here, we develop analytical and numerical models to study these acoustic coatings. The analytical model is generally based on effective medium effective medium approximation theory or homogenization theory. So what we do here is we we approximate. This is our complex media, uh, our coating where we have our soft rubber medium and in that we have cavities. So we approximate this system as a three layered media. So we have rubber on either sides and in between we have. We have. Uh, we approximate the layer of cavities as an effective medium. Uh, so for this effective medium, we have effective density, effective speed of sound and effective thickness, right? So once uh, once we are able to approximate, once we are able to derive the effective properties, then we can use what is called the transfer matrix method. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. Uh, I have not included a lot of equations in my slides, but if you're interested, you can always uh, refer uh, my papers. I'm going to uh, give details of some of my papers here. I mean, uh, in some of the slides, uh, but if you have any questions on how we do it, I'm happy to answer it uh, in this session or any time after that, right? So this is how this is how we develop analytical models for our acoustic coatings. So the effective the effective properties of the homogenized layer is generally derived in terms of the geometric properties of the coating. So here the geometric properties are the radius or diameter of the uh, inclusions and the spacing between them. So these are the two main geometric properties. And density of soft medium, soft rubber medium, as well as inclusions. Uh, when we have voided inclusions, we don't need to worry about the density of the uh, material inside. But when we have hard inclusions, uh, we have to take that into account. And then elastic moduli of the soft medium. Uh, if you have hard inclusions uh, for which the stiffness is much larger than the stiffness of your soft rubber medium, it is safe to, uh, we can approximately ignore the elastic moduli of the inclusions, hard inclusions. Then uh, the effective properties also include local resonance of the inclusions. Uh, for voided inclusions, it's monopole resonance, and for, uh, for hard inclusions, it is dipole resonance. Then this is also very important. Uh, when you have inclusions or scatterers in close proximity, you have multiple scattering of waves between them. And it is really it's very important to uh, account for multiple scattering of waves in the in the model. So let's talk a bit about the transfer matrix method. Uh, probably some of you are already aware of this. So a transfer matrix actually relates the fluid, the acoustic pressure and fluid velocities at the input and output of the output of the system. So once we know the density and uh, once we know the dimensions and material properties of different layers, we calculate the transfer matrix for each layers and then we multiply them and then we get this total transfer matrix, which is just a multiplication of transfer matrices for different media. So if you see here, the uh, uh, here you also have the impedance of the medium on the incident side and transmission side, right? Uh, and here Z, is actually the characteristic impedance of the material, which is just density times speed of sound in the medium. So uh, for, for our rubber medium, it is very easy to calculate the impedance. For our homogenized layer, we calculate effective density, effective bulk modulus or effective longitudinal modulus. From there, we calculate effective sound speed, and then we just multiply the effective density with effective sound speed and we get the effective uh, impedance of the homogenized layer. Uh, so uh, after this step, 
we use the transfer matrix or the total transfer matrix to calculate the reflected and transmitted pressures. And from there, we calculate the transmission, reflection and absorption coefficients like this. So the transmission coefficient is simply a ratio of transmitted pressure to incident pressure, whereas the reflect reflection coefficient is a ratio of reflected pressure to the incident pressure. We generally use uh, incident pressure of one. The amplitude is one so that the reflection coefficient is simply reflected pressure. And this is how we calculate the absorption coefficient, sound absorption coefficient. All right, so that was analytical model. Uh, we also develop numerical models to validate our analytical models and numerical models are also, uh, especially if you're developing a finite element method based numerical models, you can see how a certain quantity of interest, for example, pressure or displacement is varying within your domain, right? So that helps you understand the physical mechanisms in a much better way. Yeah, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, displacement plots in uh, in some of the following slides, but uh, so numerical models are used for two purposes. Firstly, to validate the analytical model and to get sort of more insights into what's happening, uh, like how the wave is interacting with our coating. OK, so uh, the way we develop numerical model is schematically described here. This is our coating, which we simulate using a solid domain solid mechanics module. I'm, I'm going to uh, sh uh, give a hands on exercise on this where we will have one layer of uh, one layer of cavities in a soft medium. So in the direction of sound propagation, we will have one cavity, but it is periodic in this direction, right? So we assume that our cavity. Uh, so this is it's infinite in this direction. OK, so uh, we model the rubber domain uh, using solid mechanics module. If you have a steel backing or hard inclusions, we model them also using solid mechanics module. We model the incident pressure in uh, sorry incident. Sorry, we model the fluid domains on both incidence and transmission sites using uh, uh, using pressure acoustics module in Comsol, and then we define what is called acoustic structure boundary condition to account for the interactions between these two different these two physics, pressure acoustics and solid mechanics. Right, and as I said, uh, we have infinite number of scatterers in this direction uh, and they're arranged periodically. So uh, for numerical simulations, we use what is called periodic boundary conditions uh, to simulate the uh, infiniteness in this direction. Between the solid and void, it's just free boundary condition. But if you want to simulate air, uh, which is inside your cavity, you can model your air and then you can define acoustic structure boundary condition here. Acoustic structure boundary physics boundary condition. OK, on either ends, we define an equip boundary condition. You can either define it using perfectly matched layer condition or uh, you also have some radiation conditions. So there is uh, in when it comes to numerical simulations using finite element methods, there is always many ways to go about it. So you can either do it using PML condition or you can do it using great plane wave radiation condition or any other condition and they all give more or less the same results. If applied correctly. Awesome, so I have talked about analytical model and numerical model. Let's talk. Let's talk about some results now. So let's start with uh, this simple rubber medium and in that we have cavities. We have a layer of cavities. So in the direction of sound propagation, we have either one layer or four layers of cavities, right? And it's periodic. The density is very, the density of rubber is very close to the density of water, which is 1000 kilograms per meter cube. The bulk modulus and shear modulus values are given here. You can derive them using Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, you'll also notice that both bulk modulus and shear modulus values, they're both complex. So the imaginary part here actually represents damping, right? Uh, in a real material, you always have damping, so it's really important to account for damping correctly. Uh, as you can see here, the bulk modulus of our soft rubber is much larger compared to the shear modulus, or I should say the other way. The shear modulus of rubber is much smaller compared to the bulk modulus 
right? And this is one of the characteristics of soft media. The shear modulus is very small compared to bulk modulus. And you will also see that the shear damping in the material is very high compared to uh, the damping of bulk waves in the media. And this is this is very common for soft soft media. These are some geometric properties. Uh, the void radius is 0.94 centimeters. Uh, I chose this for one of my papers, but I mean it's you, it, it's just a random number. Distance between the voids is five centimeters, so the center to center distance here is five centimeters. Rubber thickness for the case when you have one layer of voids in the direction of sound propagation is ten centimeters, and when you have four layers, it is twenty five centimeters. So let's say if you have extra layers here, the spacing between the center to center spacing here in the direction of sound propagation is also five centimeters. So this slide shows the sound speed in the media. Uh, sorry, phase speed and attenuation in the media. Uh, here I am comparing the phase speed and attenuation in the homogeneous rubber medium or uniform rubber medium with the homogenized layer which is created by homogenization of your cavities in, in the rubber medium. So as you can see, it, they behave very differently, right? Here uh, for uniform rubber, as you know, the frequency in general does not, uh, sorry, the sound speed in general does not change with frequency, uh, right? Whereas here for the effective medium or for the effective medium, which is made by homogenization of cavities in your soft media, there is there is a huge change in the sound phase speed and attenuation, especially around monopole resonance. So this is where the monopole resonance occurs. Uh, so here the sound speed isn't going negative, but you can have certain parameters with which you will see that the sound speed can go negative. It is possible. Uh, for this case, the it, it is it is safe to have quasi static approximation for density. Uh, it is safe to assume that the density does not change with frequency, right? But uh, when you have uh, cavities in soft media, the bulk modulus and therefore the phase speed and attenuation change with frequency. So this slide shows the transmission coefficient when you have one layer of voids and four layers of voids in your soft media obtained analytically as well as numerically, right? So you can see that the results are in very close agreement and uh, you see that there's a trough in the transmission coefficient. This trough corresponds to monopole resonance of the of the cavity, as you can see in the displacement plot here from here. So as you can see here, uh, the we used finite element method to validate our analytical model as well as to get some more insights into what's happening within our complex media. It's very difficult to do this analytically, uh, but with numerical models, you can easily plot how the deformation or pressure changes within your domain, and that way you can get broader understanding of what's happening in your media. So this trough in the transmission coefficient is due to monopole resonance of the voids. Uh, let's talk about what happens when you attach your coating to a steel backing. So just a reminder, when we have steel backing, we have water on the incident side and air on the transmission side. So there is very heavy impedance mismatch here on the transmission side. These are the material properties. It, the material properties are similar. Geometric properties are slightly different here. OK, so this is how the transmission coefficient looks because there is very heavy impedance mismatch on the transmission side. The transmission coefficient is really, really small here compared to the water backing case, right? So on this slide, I am comparing the transmission coefficient of a uniform rubber. When I say uniform rubber, it just means that we have a rubber medium like this, but no cavities, right? And that rubber medium is attached to your steel backing. So you can see that when you have cavities in your rubber medium, uh, the transmission coefficient can be reduced significantly, especially around the monopole resonance frequency. And again, this figure 
shows the displacement or deformation of the soft medium. Again, I'm just showing a unit cell. You uh, you actually have a repetition of this in this direction. So again, here the monopole resonance of inclusions or monopole resonance of voids leads to low sound transmission. Let's look at sound absorption now. Uh, so this is how the sound absorption looks. You see that there are peaks of very high sound absorption at certain frequencies when you have cavities in a soft medium attached to a rigid backing, right? And uh, uh, this is the sound absorption of a uniform rubber medium. So as you can see, when you have a uniform rubber, rubber medium, they don't perform very well, especially at low frequencies. Right. So these two peaks, they correspond to the first peak here corresponds to the mass spring resonance of the system. Here, the mass is provided by your steel backing and the stiffness is provided by your layer of voids. Right. So that mass spring resonance creates a peak of very high sound absorption. The second peak here is so you have your incident wave in this direction. It gets it gets scattered from the cavities in different direc directions. It reaches some of the incident wave reaches the steel backing and they get reflected. And the second peak is created when there is interference between the waves reflected by the backing and those scattered by the cavities. So that interference also leads to a peak of very high sound absorption. And this is periodic. If you go higher in frequency, you will see that this is periodic in frequency. This was for voided inclusions. Let's talk about hard inclusions now. Uh, again, uh, we just have a layer of hard inclusions, hard cylinders in a soft medium uh, with water backing or steel backing. Right? These are the material properties and these are the dimensions. Uh, I think I have already talked about this before. So these boundary conditions like anechoic boundary conditions, acoustic structure condition, they remain the same as it was for avoided rubber coating. Uh, the only thing which is different here is that instead of, of a void or vacuum here, we now have a solid inclusion that right? this is made of steel. And uh, here to model this, we define what is called continuity boundary condition. So these two both domains are solid domains. This is showing the effective density of different uh, materials. First is, uh, so this is for the homogenized layer. Homogenized layer made by homogenization of your hard cylinders in a soft medium. These are the, these are the density values for rubber medium and for steel. So as you can see that the homogenized the density or the effective density of the homogenized layer can vary a lot in uh, with respect to frequency. And again, uh, here this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. And the imaginary part is already negative, but even the real part can go negative at certain frequencies. Uh, if you pick if, if you pick a particular combination of material and geometric properties. So this is how the absorption coefficient uh, looks when you have water on both sides and hard inclusions in your rubber medium. It's just a one layer. So you see that uh, even when you have hard inclusions, it is performing better compared to a uniform rubber. The absorption coefficient is not as high as uh, it was for voided inclusions. For voided inclusions, it was about 100% sound absorption. But here, even though it is 20%. Uh, uh, one of the advantages of using hard inclusions is that the performance here does not change with hydrostatic. I mean, it's not significantly affected when you apply hydrostatic pressure, whereas when you have vo voided inclusions, the performance can may significantly degrade when you apply hydrostatic pressure. So that's one of the advantages of using hard inclusions. Uh, you see there are mainly two peaks, one peak over here and one peak over here. This peak is due to dipole resonance of hard inclusions in your soft medium, which dipole resonance, as I have talked before, is just a oscillation of your inclusion 
in the direction of sound propagation. So back and forth oscillation in this direction at, a, at, at this frequency. Uh, the second peak here. So uh, remember we have water backing here. We have water on both sides here as well as here. But even though the impedance of water and rubber are close, they're not exactly the same, at least for the material properties I have chosen here. So there's some impedance mismatch between your PDMS medium and the uh, and the fluid medium, which is water on the transmission side. So that the interference between the waves scattered by your hard inclusions and those reflected by uh, this boundary, which is fluid, sorry, uh, rubber fluid boundary creates this peak. Uh, for water backing case, as, as you can see, this peak is not very significant, but when you have high impedance mismatch here, you will see here in this slide. So when you have steel backing, uh, you get a much, much higher peak at, the, at that frequency. So again here, the first peak, which is due to dipole resonance of inclusions, it does not depend on the type of backing. It's the sound absorption is more or less the same uh, whether you have uh, hard backing or water backing. But here, the second peak, which is due to interference of waves reflected by scatterers and those reflected, sorry, scattered by the inclusions and those reflected by the backing, you see that this peak increases significantly when you have a rigid backing. Uh, now let's talk about a couple of different combinations. So in, as I was saying before, coatings are generally de generally designed with either voided inclusions or hard inclusions. Uh, but in this study, we just we try to study what happens when you have a combination of uh, inclusions, right? So we, uh, I mean, for uniformity, we have two layers of inclusions in the direction of sound propagation, which is this direction. So we tried voided, voided, hard, hard, voided, hard, and hard and voided, right? Just to see how the performance uh, performance of these different types of coatings compare. And this is with water backing, when you have water backing on both sides. So remember when you have water backing, you don't really have very strong mass spring resonance uh, because, because you don't have, you don't have the mass of the backing, right? So you only have one major peak, this peak, and this peak is due to dipole resonance of your hard inclusions, dipole resonance of your hard inclusion. So you see that when in this case, when you have two layers of voids, you don't really have dipole. I mean, this is not due to dipole resonance. This is due to interference between the waves by these two scatterers. When you have two hard inclusions, you have some dipole resonance. Uh, when you have a layer of voids followed by a layer of hard inclusions, this, this, the performance of this design is the worst because what happens is at this layer, uh, the layer of voids, it's a very heavy reflector. So it mostly reflects all this incident sound pressure over here. And that, uh, that means that you don't have enough acoustic energy here to excite the dipole resonance or dipole motion. So that's why you don't really see any peak over here. However, when you have this case where you have a layer of hard inclusions followed by a layer of voided inclusion, you see that there's a peak of really high sound absorption. And this is because uh, this layer of voided inclusion uh, provides, uh, I mean, it reduces the stiffness and that means a dipole resonance uh, the hard inclusions can oscillate at a larger amplitude because the stiffness here is smaller, right? And that that leads to this peak of very high sound absorption. Uh, this is with uh, steel backing. Uh, sorry, yeah, this is with steel backing for those four different coating designs. So when you have a, a steel backing and when you have voids, you always have this mass spring resonance, this uh, peak of sound, uh, really high sound absorption at low frequency, right? So this is for when you have two voids in the direction of sound propagation. This is when you have two hard inclusions. When you have two hard inclusions, you don't really have a uh, monopole, uh, you don't really have the mass spring resonance. 
this is with a layer of voids followed by a layer of hard inclusions. Again, you see here when you have voids, you have this first peak of really high, high sound absorption, but the dipole resonance does not happen. And again, the reason is the same. Uh, the layer of voids reflects all the incident sound wave. And this is the last case where you have a layer of hard inclusions followed by a layer of voided inclusions. In this case, you see that you have a really, uh, I mean, the sound absorption performance of this design is uh, much better compared to other designs considered here. So as you can see here, I mean, even with the simple two dimensional models, uh, you can get a lot of insights into what's happened into the physical mechanisms on like how these different coatings are going to behave, right? And then you can always move to three dimensional, uh, three dimensional coatings or three dimensional uh, geometries. Uh, for example, here we have spherical inclusions, spherical voids, I would say, cavities, uh, and they're arranged periodically in a soft medium. And here again, I'm presenting results for one and four layers. You can see that uh, this is the monopole resonance frequency. And at monopole resonance, you see that there is really low sound transmission through your structure. Uh, you can model different shapes. Uh, and doing it analytically is actually fun. Doing it numerically is easy. You can simply change the shape of your inclusions. But uh, when you have complex shaped voids, there is new damping phenomena which i mean when you have symmetry here uh, when you have you have symmetry here in all directions right so when you have spherical inclusions it generates shear waves but when you have some sort of asymmetry in your inclusion design it is it generates shear waves more efficiently that means it converts your pressure waves to shear waves more efficiently and that means that uh, your transmission coefficient uh, reduces. Uh, I'm not sh showing a comparison plot here, but if you have, let's say, spherical inclusions and disc shaped inclusions of the same size, you will see that disc shaped inclusions are going to give much lower. Uh, the sound transmission coefficient will be much lower when you have disc shaped inclusions. And the other thing is it also shifts, this, shifts the resonance frequency to a lower frequency, uh, which is which is good, right? You, uh, you can. It's very easy to absorb, or it's very easy to control high frequency waves, uh, but low frequency waves are the problem. So if you can move the the resonance frequency to a lower frequency, that is always beneficial. Then we have hard inclusions. So here we have steel balls arranged in a sort of hexagonal lattice here. Uh, uh, then this is showing what happens to the absorption coefficient when you increase the number of layers. I'm, I'm not going too much into the detail here. Uh, I wanted to cover the physical mechanisms using simple two dimensional model and then talk about these 3D models uh, uh, very briefly. If you're interested, uh, I have referred the papers here. You can always go and have a read. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. OK, then we studied the effect of uncertainty uh, because when you're manufacturing anything, you always have some uncertainty, right? Uh, there's some uncertainty, especially when you're dealing with rubber kind of material. Rubber is like recipe. So every time you make rubber, you get slightly different material properties. <laughs> so it's like you're making pasta and every time you make pasta, the taste is slightly different, right? So to account for that, you need to uh, you need to account for the uncertainty in your geometric and material properties uh, on on I mean you need to study how that affects the performance of your coating. So uh, this is just a representative result here. There was uncertainty in the uh, spacing between the inclusions, spacing between the voids, diameter of the voids, this thickness and the material properties of your rubber medium. So uh, as you can see here, the properties vary by a lot. So this is the envelope, right? Uh, then we have recently started integrating uh, these our models for acoustic coatings to cylindrical shell, right? Uh, because ideally, 
I mean, for acoustic characterization, it's fine. You can have either water backing or steel backing, but in reality, you are going to attach your acoustic coating to a marine vessel, for example, right? So it is important to understand how your coating performs when you attach it to a certain geometry. We started with a cylindrical shell, uh, but yeah, you can consider cylindrical shell with stiffness or uh, internal mass, internal resonators, uh, and that is what we, we are going to be doing uh, in future. So as you can see here, this is the sound. So here we have a cylindrical shell and that is subject to a point force, right? It's a two dimensional shell, uh, so it's actually a line force here. So you see that this is the radiated pressure from your shell when you don't have anything. This is the bare shell. When you apply uniform rubber coating, you see that the sound radiation, radiation actually increases. So you need to be very careful with uh, how you're designing your coating. Uh, but when you have voided rubber coating, this is again the monopole resonance frequency. You see that the sound radiation reduces significantly around monopole resonance when you have void, voided rubber coating. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's all I wanted to cover in the first part of uh, my lecture. In the second part, uh, I'm going to give a hands on uh, a console exercise. So we are let's aim to reproduce the first results uh, which we saw. So we just have uh, we will start simple. Uh, so we have a layer of rubber here and in that we have inclusions of so sorry voided inclusions, one layer of voided inclusions and we have water on both sides. We'll start with this. Uh, but once you know how this works, you can easily change the geometry and generate results for for the other cases. So uh, we are going to do a multi-physics uh, numerical simulation using finite element method uh, using COMSOL, of course. So let's get started. To launch COMSOL, I just need to do this. COMSOL, uh, in my experience, is really good uh, when you want to do multi-physics simulations. Uh, there are many different finite element softwares, as you guys may know already, but they're good for certain kind of problems. For example, if you want to do only structural simulations, ANSYS is, in my experience, the best. But if you have to do multi-physics simulations, uh, in my experience, I mean, I haven't used a lot of multi-physics software, uh, but COMSOL is really good when you're dealing with uh, different multiple different physics. So this is how your console window looks like when you open it. Here you have model wizard. From here you can select whether you want to do simulations in 3D, 2D axisymmetric or 2D. For this problem, let's do uh, 2D simulations. You can do 3D simulations as well, but it's just that the solution time is going to be much higher. So uh, in the interest of time, Let's do a 2D simulation. The physics we are going to use today are acoustics and structural mechanics. So in acoustics, we have this pressure acoustics. Uh, so we, we are going to do a frequency domain simulation. We will select this and then add it. And then we are going to have our solid mechanics module. So we are going to model the, the fluid domains on the incidence and transmission sides of the coating or the voided rubber using pressure acoustics. Whereas we are going to model the coating or the voided rubber coating using solid mechanics module. So I'll add this. So we have two different physics here, right? If you want, you can have other physics as well. For example, if you want to study the effect of flow, uh, you can have this convected acoustics module uh, and you have a, if you want to study the effect of, uh, for example, heat or temperature, you can have a thermal module or heat transfer module, which you don't see here because they, I haven't, inst I haven't inst installed it. So let's press study. Now it is asking us what kind of study we want to do. So to get the uh, sound coefficients, we are going to do a frequency domain simulation. And again, uh, what I'm doing here, this is just one of the ways to do it. I mean, this is not the only way. When it comes to finite element method, you always have 
many different ways to go about it. For example, you can do a time domain simulation and then convert it to, for example, uh, you, you can do a Fourier transform and get results in frequency domain, right? But uh, for the kind of problem which I deal with, it is uh, it is sufficient to do analysis in frequency domain. So I'll press done. And then this is the window that comes up, right? So here in global definitions, you can define your parameters. Sorry, in global definitions, you have parameters. So you can, it's a good idea. It's a good practice to define all your parameters here at one place and then use the variable names when you're, for example, creating a geometry or defining your material properties. Uh, so that uh, if you have one, all parameters at one place, it is easy to do a parametric study, right? Rather than uh, going and changing things uh, inside. So let's define the parameters here. I will bring up the parameters which we have here. Yep. Not that one. Yeah, this one. So the density is 1000 kilograms per meter cube. Bulk modulus is this and shear modulus is this. Let's define the material properties first. So I'll call it rho R. So this is the density of rubber, which is 1000. And in COMSOL, uh, you can use whatever unit you want. Just you can define your units like this. Kilograms per meter cube. So this is how we define the density. If you want, you can also leave a short description here. Uh, like what is this corresponding to? And then you can have your longitudinal modulus. Longitudinal modulus is was one gigapascals, so one e nine. And then we have to have we have complex number here, one one plus zero point zero one i, which is the imaginary component, and here. The unit is or if you want to if you feel like defining it in terms of gigapascals you can do this into here and that's going to it's going to give the same thing the shear modulus let's call it g r which is the for the rubber medium is 0.6 megapascals 0.6 e6 times 1 plus 0 0.3 times or 0 0.3 i so this is the shear modulus of our rubber medium then uh, so this material properties of the rubber is defined we can also define the material properties of water so material rho let's call it rho w for water is 1000 kilograms per meter cube And then sea water uh, for acoustic domain, we need density and sound speed. So let's call it CW is 1500 meters per second. Right. So all material properties are not defined. If you want, you can define the material properties of air as well and fill your cavity with air. Uh, now let's define the dimensions. So the let's do simulations for just one layer of cavities and you can repeat this simulation if you want to have multiple layers of cavities in the direction of sound propagation right so for a single layer the rubber thickness is 10 centimeters void radius is 0.95 and the distance between the voids is 5 centimeters so let me start with radius let me call it a this was 0.94 centimeters. T was T is the thickness. Thickness was 10 centimeters. And D is the or let me call it S S for spacing between the inclusions. That is that was 5 centimeters. Right. Oh, it's not allowing me to use. It's a reserved name. So let me call it T. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Let me call it D and see if it allows me. Yeah, I can use D. 
So now we have defined all our material and geometric properties we are going to need today, right? Uh, in any as in any finite element simulations, you have three main steps, right? Pre-processing, solution, and post-processing. Pre-processing is about creating your geometry, defining your boundary conditions, defining material properties, uh, and meshing. That's your pre-processing, and then solution, and then post-processing. When you're when you're working with a uh, with a commercial software, the solution and post-processing part is not generally not that difficult. I mean, especially the solution part, the software does it for you. Uh, we need to spend some time in the pre-processing part, which is building our model, right? So let's start with geometry. Let's start with building a geometry. So here, if you right click, you will see that there are different shapes. We are dealing with a two dimensional model, so that's why you're seeing only two dimensional shapes here. If you're doing, if you had selected 3D instead of 2D in the first step, you would see options for 3D like blocks and spheres and ellipsoids and stuff, right? So let me select a rectangle. You can define the width and height here. Width is the thickness, basically. We have called it T, and height is the Height is the lattice spacing for us, which is D. And you can define it with respect to corner or center. In this case, it might be a good idea to use center, but you can also define it using corner. So here we now have our rubber domain, right? Now the second step is to define our water domain. Uh, there's no particular order for this, but uh, uh, this is how I generally do. So for fluid domains, as a thumb rule, the length of your fluid domains should be at least a quarter wavelength long. But in my experience, especially in numerical simulations, uh, sometimes you don't need that, especially for this case. Uh, if you have, let's say, a water domain that is maybe five or six times of the thickness of your rubber, that is fine. Uh, and if you define your uh, absorption conditions properly, it works. But as a thumb rule, you need to, the thickness should be at least a quarter wavelength, right? So uh, I'm just choosing an arbitrary number here. I'm just choosing, let's say, maybe 200 centimeters. It is the same, which is D. Now I will press build selected. Again, here I should change this to center for consistency. So now I have built my rubber domain. Uh, let me close this. So this is my rubber domain. And on either sides of this rubber domain, we have water. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is create a cavity here, right, in my rubber domain. To do that, I'll go here. Again, right click on circle. Here you can define your radius. Uh, I have called the radius A, and then I have selected uh, center here. So now it should create a geometry at the center. Our next step would be to remove this circle from our rectangle, right? To do that, we, we, we are going to do a Boolean operation. Uh, we are going to use this difference thing. So objects to add, we will select this domain as well as the domain in the back. So remember you have two layers here and it is important that you select both layers. Object to subtract will be this and then we will just press build selected. So now we have a cavity, we have a rubber domain and we have our fluid domains. Uh, I'm going to use plane wave radiation condition, so I don't need to model the PML domains, but if you want to do it using PML, uh, it's the same thing. You just, you'll have to define your uh, PML domains here and here, right? Uh, so now our first part is done. We have built our geometry. Next step is to define materials, right? So, but before defining materials, it is a good idea to select the domains so that you only need to uh, define the 
appropriate material properties here. For example, for us, uh, these two domains are pressure acoustics domains or acoustic domains. So I will unselect this. Now you can see that these two domains, the fluid domains are our acoustic domains. Our solid mechanics module, uh, solid mechanics. So this only this bit, which is our voided rubber, will be simulated using solid mechanics. So I'm going to unselect this and unselect this. So now uh, the other thing is uh, for solid mechanics, you can define material properties in many different ways. You need density and any two elastic moduli. For example, here uh, by default, it asks for Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, which you can define. I mean, uh, you can define it using Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. But in acoustics, in my experience, it is a good idea to talk in terms of longitudinal modulus and shear modulus. So to do that, just go here and select bulk modulus and shear modulus. Now, when you define material here, it will ask you to define bulk modulus and shear modulus instead of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. OK, so now let's go back here and define our materials. I will just define a blank material first. So by so uh, you have to select the domains here by default. All the domains are selected, uh, but I should be defining the properties separately. So I am going to first define the properties of my water domains. So the density was rho w. We have defined it already and sound speed is CW. Right, so we have defined the material properties of water. Now let's define the material properties of the rubber medium. So for this, uh, nothing is selected. I'm going to select this domain over here. And now you can see that it is asking for bulk modulus, shear modulus and density. So density was rho R. We have already defined this in our parameters section. Bulk modulus was KR. And then shear modulus was GR. Right. So now we have defined all the material properties for the uh, for our rubber medium. Next thing we have to do is to apply different boundary conditions. Right. So to do that, let's start with the acoustics domain. So because we have periodicity in this direction, uh, this is infinite in this direction. We are going to apply periodic conditions here and here, right here and here. So you can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can either define it using symmetry conditions or you can use periodic boundary conditions. They both give very similar results and even within periodic boundary conditions, you have many different options. The simplest one is continuity, but you can also define it using Floquet condition, uh, for example. So I'm going to use continuity. Uh, this Floquet condition is more useful when you have uh, your incident wave which is not perpendicular, not perpendicular or which is not in this direction. If you have, let's say, uh, incident wave which is oblique, then Floquet condition works. But when you have uh, when you have uh, a normal incidence, it's OK to use continuity. It, uh, it gives it works pretty well. So I'm going to select all these edges. So now what this what this is basically saying is that our water domain on the incidence side is infinite and similarly on the transmission side. So that is done. Next thing I'm going to do is define the absorption condition here uh, because we don't want any reflection of sound wave from here. We are going to have we'll have to define some sort of absorption condition. And as I was saying before, you can do this in a couple of different ways. You can use PML condition or you can use uh, uh, you can define an impedance boundary or you can define uh, plane wave radiation condition. I'm going to use plane wave radiation condition today. Radiation condition, plane wave radiation condition, and I can do this because I'm de dealing with a simple plane wave, right? So to do this, all you have to do is select these two edges. And now your plane wave radiation condition is defined. So the only thing which is pending now is to define the incident wave. So to do that, just go here, click. Click on incident pressure field 
and then you will be able to define the incident pressure. So here uh, you have to be a bit careful because COMSOL by default. So if you select these two edges for uh, plane wave radiation condition, by default COMSOL applies incident pressure on both these edges, which is not true, right? We want incident pressure only here. Our incident wave is traveling in this direction, right? So unless you want to simulate a scenario where you have incident pressure from both sides, which you do in certain cases uh, in when you are talking in terms of coherent potential approximation and stuff you do that but for our case we have to do we have to define it only in one direction so now we will go here i will just unselect everything so if you click this it clears your selection and now i will go and select this right so now my uh, all my boundary conditions for the acoustic domains are defined, including the incident pressure. I will go to solid mechanics module now. In solid mechanics module, again, I'll have to define the periodicity condition. So where is the periodic condition? Periodicity condition here, connection here. So in connect connections, it appears here. Uh, again, uh, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can define it using periodicity or symmetry. They all give very similar results for these kind of simple problems. So select this and select this. And here between your cavity or between your void and your soft rubber medium, you have free condition. By default, uh, COMSOL applies sound hard boundary condition where you have not defined any boundary conditions for acoustics module. And similarly for solid mechanics module, if you haven't if you haven't defined any boundary condition by default, COMSOL applies free boundary condition. So as you can see here, we have free free boundary condition over here and here and here, right? We haven't defined the uh, multi physics boundary condition here at the moment. So that's why you see that you have this free boundary condition on both sides. So that's done. This is done. Next thing we should do is define the multi physics conditions. So for our case, we are dealing with acoustic and acoustic structure interaction problem. So we will just click here and now we can define. We can simply select these two domains and now you're uh, if you uh, want to have a look at uh, this is actually one of the good things about console. You can actually see what this boundary condition is doing over here. It gives you the equation. I haven't seen this in other software, for example, in ANSYS. You don't really see. Uh, I mean, you know uh, what ANSYS is doing, but they don't show the equations there. Uh, this is something I like about console. OK, uh, so now our boundary conditions are defined. Next thing we should be doing is meshing. So as I was saying before, uh, in acoustics as a thumb rule, you should have at least six elements per wavelength, uh, but you should also do a convergence study to make sure that your results have converged. Uh, especially when you're dealing with scattering problems, uh, six elements per wavelength may not be enough. Uh, for but for this problem, in my experience, uh, six, six, six or eight elements per wavelength is good. So to define the uh, size of maximum element, let's define the sound speed in rubber. Let me call it CLR. So this is the pressure wave speed in rubber. This is so you can easily calculate it from here. Longitudinal modulus divided by density, and if you take a square root of it, the sound speed will be around. Uh, it will be exactly 1000 meters per second. Then you define your frequency range, so uh, your maximum and minimum frequency. Let me I will use minimum frequency of 50 Hertz. Doesn't like curly brackets. I'll have to use square bracket here. F max, which is the maximum frequency of interest. Uh, let me use 10 kilohertz, for example. 10 kilohertz. And you also have to define frequency step. Uh, you don't need it to calculate the size of your elements, but you need it uh, here when you're defining your study. So let me just define it while I'm here. I will use a frequency step of 
10 hertz, for example. Okay. Now let's define the size of the element. Uh, to start with, let's say I want eight elements per wavelength. So ELPW elements per wavelength. Let's say I want eight elements per wavelength. So now the size of your largest element makes EL. It should be. It can you can calculate it simply by writing CLR divided by F max, which is your maximum frequency of interest, and divided by number of elements per wavelength you want. So I want eight elements per wavelength. Wavelength. So this is going to give me uh, element size of this. I'm going to start with eight and then see how it looks. Uh, if you see, uh, but you should in any finite, as in any finite element simulation, you should do a convergence study, right? So to do that, I'll go to mesh. Sometimes in console, I have seen that this physics controlled mesh works very well, right? I mean, uh, they have really clever algorithms uh, based on your the type of physics you're using. Uh, it it gives you a couple of default options. It works very well for this case, but as I was saying before, when you have hard inclusions, it doesn't work. So as a best practice, it is always a good idea to define your mesh size in terms of number of elements per wavelength, right? So instead of physics control mesh, which is default, I'm going to select user controlled mesh. And now I'm going to define the size here. So uh, here again, you have some uh, some conditions. So what I'll do is I'll select extremely fine and see what the element size is. It is 0 0.02, whereas here it is 0 0.125. So I can I can change this to 1 to 5. And then you can press build all and it's going to build. It doesn't look very good. The mesh doesn't look very good, but I think it's, it should be fine for this kind of problem. Uh, but if you want more structured mesh, you have more options here. Uh, uh, I'm not going to worry about that uh, in this tutorial. So our meshing is done. Next step is to define the frequency values. So your maximum, minimum and frequency steps. So minimum frequency was F min. We have already defined this in the parameters section. Frequency step is F step, which was 10 Hertz from memory and then the maximum was F max. And you can do this. So now we have defined everything you should be defining. So this pre-processing part is done, uh, but we also need to, uh, before solving, I think it's also a good idea to, to, to define what is it, what output you are looking from for console. You don't have to do it, you can do it later, but I think it's a good idea to do it. So we want transmission coefficient for our simple case here. We want to reproduce this black line here, right? So to do plot the transmission coefficient, uh, you can simply go here, go to functions, not selections, probably probe. There's many different ways you can do it again, uh, but probably the simplest way is using this boundary probe option. Uh, by default, it selects everything. Uh, so we want to measure the transmitter pressure here, right? Uh, in this in this domain over here. So this is this is the total pressure, but if you're not sure what this means, you can go here and then these are the things which you this that these are the output you can get from your model here. So pressure and sound pressure level. Uh, we need this. ACPR absolute value of the total acoustic pressure. This should give us what we have got in that slide, right? So that is done and now. Uh, so if you solve it, console is auto automatically going to generate the plot here. Uh, it's going to generate a couple of plots here, but I'm going to show you if, if it doesn't, if console doesn't generate the plot you're looking for, uh, it's possible to do that. I'm going to show that in a minute, but before that, let's hit compute and go to the second step, which is to 
which is the solution. Uh, total acoustic pressure is zero. Why is that? Uh, and this could be because I haven't defined the incident pressure correctly, probably. Let's see. So we have this incident pressure. If you see, I left the incident pressure to be zero, which is not good, right? You have to define the amplitude of your incident pressure. Uh, I generally use one, and the reason for that is if you use pressure amplitude of one, you can define your reflection and transmission coefficient. Your reflection and transmission coefficients basically become your reflected and transmitted pressures. So this is just something one one way to do it. The sound speed is 1500, and here this is by default this works. But if you uh, if you have a wave traveling in this direction, you can also use one and zero to define that. And now let's let's hit compute again and solve. Yep, now you see some numbers. It shouldn't take too long. This is a really small model. Should just take a couple of minutes. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or feel free to turn on your microphone and ask your question orally. Yep, so the solution is done. So now you can see console creates a couple of plots by default based on the physics you choose. It creates a couple of plots, uh, but I'm going to show you uh, how you can get more things from here. So this prop plot group four, this should be our. This should be our transmission coefficient, right? So I think it's also a good practice to rename things like, for example, this boundary probe one, you can call it transmission coefficient. For transmitted pressure. And then when you come here, you see that. Sorry, I need to hit update results here. And now when you come here, Yeah, you can you can define this thing here as well. Transmission coefficient. Or transmitted pressure, it's basically the same in our case. So now plot. So that has actually changed this. Transmitted pressure instead of probe one. Oh, I see I have made a typo here. This should be transmitted pressure. OK, so this is our transmission coefficient, but does it look like this? Oh yeah, this is in log scale, so you can plot uh, it in log scale like this. And now if you compare this with the black line, it is especially the dotted black lines here, you will see that the, the results are very close, but it should exactly be the same if the mesh is converged, right? So this is how you can do multi physics simulations using Comsol. Uh, yeah, so I have this deformation plot as well. By default, Comsol doesn't give you a deformation plot, but if you want it, it's very easy. You just go here, go to 2D plot group because we are dealing with 2D, and then right click here, do a surface plot, and then here you can select what you want to plot. So, for example, if you go here, uh, this is for solid mechanics module. And this is for displacement. For example, I'm interested in, let's say, the magnitude of displacement or sort of total displacement. So I'll go here and select solid dot disk, and then I'll come back and change the frequency here. So now we see that we have low transmission at this frequency. Uh, you can you can sort of zoom in and see what that frequency is. It is 1440 for us. So I'll just go here and change it to 1440 hertz. And I'll hit press. So now you can see 
that this displacement plot is very similar, hopefully, to what we have got here. 